Welcome to worship from St. Paul Lutheran Church in Harlingen, Texas. I'm Pastor Nathan Wendorf, and it is a joy to be able to worship together with you this day the good news of our Savior Jesus Christ, especially as we continue in our series that we've been in the book of Acts, looking at the early church, how they went about sharing that message of hope. You know, as I think about that message of hope, we get some hope and we get some encouragement when, when you like our videos, when you share those different emotions, the love and the care, and then you share it with other people. It brings us encouragement, and it brings encouragement to the people who you're friends with as well on social media. So I encourage you, if you're able to do that, do that right now. In fact, comment down here. Let us know where you're watching from, and maybe if there's other people watching with you, let us know that too. It just makes us feel good and makes us feel still this part of the community we have uh, during this interesting and strange time. We've been on our campus now for a week, a little over a week now, and been getting things ready to return to our operations, especially of our early childhood center. Great beginnings as it provides care for, for children and students in our community, and as well getting ready for returning to worship and other events here on our campus at St. Paul. We continue to, to go it slow and to be patient, and to follow especially the advice of some of the medical people that are a part of our own congregation that are helping us navigate through this strange and interesting time. We want to make sure that we're going to be part of the solution and, and don't unnecessarily cause any problems, and we want you back here. I want, you don't know how much we want you back in here. It is strange enough doing this now for a couple months, so we want you back here, and, and it's going to be soon, friends, and so in the moment, I ask you to be patient. But if you do want to return, there's good news, if, especially if you're a member of our congregation, we will have an opportunity for that Monday night for our voters meeting. And it'll be a short voters meeting, but an important one that's dictated to us by the bylaws of our church that we have it on this particular Monday at 7 p.m. And we'll hold it here out in our parking lot and in our front lawn. So you'll have an opportunity. You can sit out there. There'll be some metal chairs that have been disinfected that have been distanced apart from one another. I encourage you to, to wear your mask. You can sit in one of those chairs or you can just remain in your car and tune in on your radio to listen to the broadcast of that happening. And we have a blow up screen and we'll be able to project everything for you there as well. And if you're going to stay home, we want you still to participate. You can do that through a special opportunity through the Zoom meeting platform. Now the specific instructions for that Zoom meeting pl platform will be emailed uh, individually. So make sure you send a message to church at splch.com where Peggy Elder will receive that email and make sure that you have that invitation and any of the information that goes with that voters meeting, which will be sent out to our entire congregation on Monday so that we can be prepared to make wise decisions for the next three people who will be joining our board of directors and our fiscal budget for 2020 and 2021. Also, it's a part of that as we end that time together on Monday. For those who so desire, there'll be an opportunity for a time of corporate confession and absolution and a celebration of Holy Communion in our new safe, contactless way, but still in a way that delivers to us what Jesus himself declares to us in that bread and wine, his very body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. And that's something that we'll continue to celebrate just as soon as we get back together in our sanctuary as well. I know with our church life, we want to get back quickly. And I know like you and me, I'm finding myself hard struggling with being patient. It hit me like, like a ton of bricks this week. I was going out for lunch and grabbing a lunch at a local restaurant that has a drive through And sure enough, as soon as I get to the drive through lane, somebody pulls in front of me and they stop. Even though the speaker was open, they could go up and order. They stop at the, at the billboard or the, the, the banner before that and begin to roll down their window and they're on their cell phone and that they are reading like the entire menu to whoever's on the other end. Five minutes go by. I'm ready to honk my horn, give them a little nudge because my car is bigger than their car just to get them moving forward. And finally though, they, they move forward, they get to the speaker and I'm like, oh good. They already talked about what they're gonna order. <sighs> Another five minutes, and I'm getting really furious by now. And so finally, that car pulls away and goes around the corner. I couldn't see the, the, where it was going because that's how the window works and the way the line was designed. So I get up there, and, and I show the person behind me how to order. 15 seconds. That's all it took me. 15 seconds, got my order in, pulled around the corner, kind of maybe a little faster than I really should have in a drive through lane. Uh, and I realized right away my embarrassment and mistake. You see, it wasn't just one car in front of me. There was actually three cars in front of me. 
So, so what I realized is that even if that guy would have gone faster, I would have still gotten my order and my food in at the same exact time. I was so busy thinking about myself and how inconvenient this was, how much time this was taking out of my day so that I couldn't go back to the office and finish my worship service, finish my preparation for meetings, finish planning to tell people about Jesus, <laughs> that I didn't even think about maybe what's going on in his life. And so I started thinking about it as we waited to get our food. I thought, well, maybe he's on the phone with his mom who's maybe isolated right now. Maybe she's in quarantine and she can't get out. And so he wants to make sure he gets the right meal for her that makes her feel special and makes her feel noticed. Maybe it's for his wife who, who's a, a doctor and she's been on a, on a shift that has, and seems like it's never ended and she's been craving something from this restaurant to eat and he wanted to make sure he got it right so he could show her how much he loves her and how valuable her work is. And I started thinking about all these different reasons and I was feeling pretty guilty because I recognized that my impatience was shining through. But then it also got me thinking about what we're gonna be looking and talking about today. God, God was working in this right for me is that is, you know, I was recognizing my own impatience. I was also recognizing that that's not how God is described. No, over and over and over again in the scripture, it declares like in Nehemiah chapter 9, 17 is one of the places that says things like this. God is ready to forgive. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. In other words, God's patient. And that's a great thing for you and, and for me. Because he has every reason, I mean, think about it. He has every reason to be impatient with us, but he chooses patience instead. Why? Because patience is the way of love. You, you probably even know this because the most popular passage for almost every wedding I've ever done from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, written by the Apostle Paul, describes love. And before it goes into this whole long list of what love is and what love is not, the very first thing that Paul says love is, he says love is patient. And God is patient. And God is love. And it's an incredible attribute of the God we worship. May it be in this moment too an incredible attribute for those of us who call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High God. Made those sons and daughters not because of anything in us, but because of God himself reaching down and choosing us by faith through the power of the Spirit, assuring us in the waters of our baptism that, that we belong to him. And furthermore, that we don't just belong to him, we are sent by him, we are given his mission, the continuing work of Jesus Christ in this world as his church. A mission in which Jesus says to his disciples that the way that people are gonna know that we're disciples of Jesus is not by how we teach or how we preach or how we sing. Those things are important, they matter, but the mark that they says makes a difference is by the way that we love one another. John 13, 35. So let's love one another today by being patient. And that perhaps by seeing that love shown through patience, others would see not just us, but the source of our patience, Jesus. So welcome to worship today. Not as we desire, but as we patiently wait on the Lord and one another with love, knowing that he is patient with us as he works through this in his way to accomplish something I believe that's gonna be beyond our imagination that we can perceive in this moment. So join me. Join me in worship as we sing, as we hear the scripture read, as the word is proclaimed, and as we wait patiently, and as we begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
was conceived, conceived by, by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. But on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Today's reading is from Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20. Let everyone bless God and sing his praises, for he holds our lives in his hands, and he holds our feet to the path. You have purified us with fire, O Lord, like silver in a crucible. You captured us in your net and laid great burdens on our backs. You sent troops to ride across our broken bodies. We went through fire and flood, but in the end you brought us into wealth and great abundance. Now I have come to your temple with burnt offerings to pay my vows. For when I was in trouble, I promised you many offerings. That is why I am bringing you these fat goats, rams, and calves. The smoke of their sacrifice shall rise before you. Come and hear all of you who reverence the Lord, and I will tell you what he has done for me. For I cried to him for help with praises ready on my tongue. He would not have listened if I had not confessed my sins, but he listened, he heard my prayer, he paid attention to it. Blessed be God, who didn't turn away when I was praying and didn't refuse me his kindness and love. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, As we gather in worship this day, we remind ourselves of the words of the Apostle John who writes in 1 John chapter 1, these words, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he that is God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So let's not make God a liar. Let's admit who we are, poor, sinful people, but yet exactly who Jesus has come to seek and to save. So I now ask you some questions to which you can respond, yes, the right answer, at least according to 1 John, or no, if we're not honest with ourselves. Let's confess. Do you confess to the almighty God that you are a poor, miserable sinner? Yes. Do you confess to our merciful Father that you have sinned against him by what you have thought, by what you have done, and by what you have not done? Yes. Do you confess that you deserve both punishment and this life and in eternity because of that sin? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and shed his blood so that you might be forgiven? Yes. Do you pray and ask God for the sake of the innocent, bitter sufferings and death of his son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to you? Yes. And finally, do you believe that what I declare to you from the very word of God is the forgiveness of Jesus himself to you this day? Yes. Therefore, let it be done as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I announce to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace and the freedom and the joy that you are what your Savior Jesus declares forgiven. My future hangs on this. You make preciousness from dust. Please don't 
stop creating me Your blood offers the chance To rewind to innocence Reborn Perfect as a child No, your cross It changes everything There my world be again with you No, your cross it's where my hope restarts a second chance is heaven's heart when sin and ugliness collide with Redemption's kiss, beauty awakens by romance. Always inside this mess, I have found forgiveness. Mercy is infinite as you. No, your cross it changes everything. There my world begins again with you No, your cross is where my hope restarts A second chance is heaven's heart Countless second chances we've been given at the cross Countless second chances we've been given at the cross. Fragments of brokenness salvaged by the art of grace. You craft life from our mistakes. Black skies of my regrets outshone by this kindness, new life, dawns over my soul. No, your cross, it changes everything. There my world begins again with you. No, your cross, it's where my hope restarts. Second chance is heaven's heart. Countless second chances we've been given at the cross. Countless second chances we've been given at Chances we've been given at the cross. Our reading comes from First Peter, the third chapter, verses thirteen through twenty-two. Who is going to harm you if you were eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. 
and this water symbolizes baptism, now that saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. John 14, 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will also live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and he keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Hey kids, make sure you're sitting down and paying attention. We got a special kids message for you right now. Today we're going to talk about something that you can't see, but you know it's there. Any idea? I'll give you a hint. Do you know? Is it a pink streamer? No. But what's blowing the streamer? Yeah, the wind. Now it's the wind that does a lot of things. You can see it's blowing our branches right now. It's kind of blowing our trees, so it's strong. And it can do a lot of work. We can't see it, but it's working. That reminds me of something in the Bible. You know what that is? I'll give you another hint. It's an amazing gift that Jesus promised us when he re returned to heaven to be with his father, you know? Jesus promised us a helper, and that helper is the Holy Spirit. Now we don't see the Holy Spirit because he lives inside of us. But just like the wind blowing everything around, we can't see it, but we know it's working. And the Holy Spirit comes to bring us comfort and to help us know that? Because Jesus promised it to us. And Jesus always keeps his promises. Let's pray. God, even though we can't see you, we know you're real. We also know that your Holy Spirit is real and with us. Thank you for the comfort that you bring us through your gift, the Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The book of Acts is the history of the first 30 years of the early church, the people who were a part of the continuing work of Jesus here on earth. They were everyday, ordinary people who were empowered by God himself and the person and work of the Holy Spirit to do incredible things. Incredible things were happening by the proclamation of the gospel and the resurrection with people being called to faith and being baptized. Sometimes those conversions happened in one-on-one -on -one conversations like we saw last week between Philip and a man from Ethiopia. Other times we hear thousands thousands of people being converted, even when the preacher is arrested. Nothing could stop the work of the gospel and the growth of the church. Today, as we continue in this series, I want to explore a description of that early church in the book of Acts chapter 4, because I think it is helpful for all of us in the time that we are living in right now, because the same thing that the early church experienced is what I think we long to experience too. Luke, who is writing in the book of Acts, describes the early church in Acts chapter 4 this way. Now the full number of those who were believed were of one heart and of soul, and no one said that anything belonged to him was his own, but they had everything 
in common. Now, don't be confused here for a moment. This is not some kind of communism or socialism going on in the early church, nothing of that sort. This wasn't being done because they were compulsed to do it or because of some obligation or ideology or government program. No, no, no. This was the body of Christ being the body of Christ to one another. A group of people who had been with Jesus and learned from him, who understood that Jesus willingly went to the cross and gave up his life for them out of love. And that he's the greatest giver who gave everything to win forgiveness, life, and salvation. So those who follow Jesus, those who are part of his church, they recognize that their stuff, their possessions, as meager and as little as it would have been, that God had given it to them. And that God had entrusted it into their hands, not simply for their consumption or their pleasure. They didn't fall for what we fall so often is what I call a consumption assumption. That everything I have is for me and my life goal is to get more and more. And the more stuff I get, the more stuff I have, the more I acquire, the more money, then I'll have more pleasure, more protection, more security, uh, more power. My life will be better. I'll have more friends because I have more. And in a time right now where our consumption has been greatly hindered and changed, we become more aware of our tendency to order our lives in this unstable, unstable, but tempting way. You know, Jesus taught a lot about this dangerous way of living. At one place where he says it is in Matthew chapter six, he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. In other words, What we value the most, what matters the most to us, that's where our hearts are found. And the greatest temptation for people in Jesus' day and for people now is to value more the temporary things of this earth, our stuff, than him, Jesus himself. Perhaps a helpful way of thinking about this is is to ask yourself the question, what are you most afraid to lose in your life? Most afraid of. What couldn't you imagine living without? For many of us, the first thought that comes to mind are the people closest to us, family and friends. Maybe we think about those, those things that are intangible, freedom and our rights, or maybe we think of our house, houses. Martin Luther helps us think about this when he writes that famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, and I think it's like the fourth verse where he says, would they to take our house, good honor, child or spouse, let all these be gone, but the kingdom ours remaineth. Now, it's not to say that we want those things gone. It's not to say that they aren't important. They're very important to us. They've been given by God himself to us. But the temptation we can fall into is when we put those people in places that only God can occupy. We put them on his throne. And the danger is that when they take a higher precedent in our life, we know they're not going to live up to those expectations. And we'll be disappointed in them and we'll set them up for failure and we're going to set ourselves up for failure as well. So one of the cures for not falling into this trap is to be generous, to be generous with our time, with our resources and our abilities, not by our own strength and power, but by the power of Jesus working through us. Just like that early church, their hearts were transformed by Jesus and what he had done for them and what he had done for us and what he freely offers us, that we can't help but be generous and start to view the things that that we have as simply temporary things, as we're just stewards holding them for him. It is probably best understood in times of our stuff because when we get caught up in the consumption assumption, we need to take a step back and realize all that Jesus has given to you and we then stop holding on to it so tightly, like our money and our possessions. We realize they're just tools, they're just temporary things and we stop worrying about losing them and the control that they have over us because of that fear that we might lose them. And instead, we start thinking, how can we leverage these things? How can we leverage what God has given us that is temporary for what matters most in a way that will impact the lives of other people for eternity? So I'm really thankful right now. I'm thankful for you that the people of St. Paul in this time in which you have been incredibly generous towards our congregation and your ongoing support through your tithes and through your offerings and special gifts to our ministry. Not only have we been able to keep up with our expenses like salaries and paying bills, and we can even work on some special projects to improve our campus and to allow us to keep moving forward as we pivot back to the new normal, as we return to be able to use these facilities, and not just about us, but being blessings to others. We've been able to help other churches during this time with, with resources to make their worship services and their, and their studies happen online. 
Your food donations to those, our backpacks of love ministry, which we're going home to kids every week, some 30 kids in local schools. And when that stopped, we could redirect those, all those resources to a local food bank and pounds and pounds of food were given to people who are in crisis right now. You, you have blessed organizations financially like Blue Sunday, which is working to eliminate child abuse, something that we hear is on the rise in our community in this high stress time. And you're financially through our congregation, we'll be able to support that ministry. You supported financially the work of our partners in Uganda and Bridge of Hope ministry as they struggle with meeting the needs there on the ground in those, this time. And those are just a few examples, and I'm, I want to mention them to you, I'm not to toot our horn, no, not of that at all, but I want you to know and encourage you that as we encourage you individually to be generous towards those around you, that we're generous as a church to others as well. And that generosity, it breeds generosity because being generous, it just reminds people that we are just temporary and that what is eternal, we have an opportunity to influence by using the things that God has entrusted to us today. Let me dig back into Acts chapter four, got off on a tangent there. Acts four thirty three is where we were. Therefore, the apostles were giving testimony about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it out at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. That the heart of everything in that early church flowed from the greatest event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus. And this is the cornerstone on which the church then and the church now is built upon. And it sounds like the glory days of the church, in many ways it was. They were carrying out the mission of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. The Holy Spirit was bringing about conversion after conversion, baptism after baptism. The priorities were in line some of the time. Read more of Acts and you'll see it didn't always work out that way. They didn't have much material wealth, that's for sure. So it wasn't hard for them to give up what they had to share it with those who were in greater need. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't struggles and there weren't problems that the church will face as it carries out Jesus' mission. But even those struggles, those struggles were used to accomplish the work of Jesus through the church too. And, and that's what I want, want you to see today in our own struggles as we try to navigate ministry and, and, and what it looks like in this time. That these struggles can actually be used to accomplish more than we could even think or imagine. As long as we can keep our focus off of ourselves and put it onto those around us that we are given an opportunity to share Jesus with. You know, later on in, in Acts chapter five, we were in Acts chapter four, but, but later on in, in Acts chapter, if chapter five, those apostles, they got arrested again. And the reason they got arrested was because they kept talking about Jesus even though they were told they weren't supposed to. Yet God shows us that he's still in control and miraculously they were freed from prison, but they don't run away and, and hide out. They go right back to the temple and they talk more about Jesus. In fact, it's such a surprise to those who arrested them and put them in prison overnight what had happened that when they found them again in the temple, they arrested them again. And Peter says to them in Acts 5, 29, here's what he says. He says, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Well, you can read later on in the rest of that, they didn't, at least not at this time, kill them because they were afraid that killing them would lead to an even greater uprising inside and instead that because of their past experience, just let them go away. And so they decided instead just, just to beat them. Not pleasant, ouch. And they let them go. And once again, with even stronger terms, they forbid them to no longer talk about Jesus. And interestingly enough, the response of those who had been beaten for talking about Jesus. Earlier, we heard them pray a couple weeks ago, pray for boldness. Now, let me give you Luke's account as he says it in Acts 5, a little bit later on, Acts 5, 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not te cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Here we're in the temple and you're in your house to house. We can still do this church and we can still rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor, the dishonor of being beaten. Now that's the kind of faith in Jesus that I think we'd all strive to have. 
A faith that is so deep that recognizes that my place in the kingdom of God is worthy to suffer in order that others may know Jesus. Throughout history and even today, Christians recognize that when they are caused to suffer and even give up their lives here on earth for the sake of Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel, incredible things can happen. An early father, Tertullian, said this to the rulers of the Roman Empire. He said this, he said, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. The seed is the blood of Christians, the seed of growth. And then there's this commentary that I've been reading as we go through Acts by a man by the name of John Stott, and he put it this way. He said, persecution will refine the church, but not destroy it. If it leads to prayer and praise to an acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God and of solitary with Christ in his sufferings, then however painful, it may even be welcome. How about that? Might this time of suffering we've been going through, which is different for each of us because we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats and as we weather the storm, might this be a time of refinement? A time for us to to let go of what we were holding near and dear and to instead say, what does my neighbor need? What do those who are hurting more than I need, who is really struggling, who has a heavy burden that they are carrying as physical or emotional or job? And it's not to minimize, friends, what you are personally experiencing and going through, but instead to take some deep breaths, to step back and say, okay, what am I really afraid of losing? What am I really missing? Where have I perhaps misplaced some of my faith? Because I know Jesus has me. I know Jesus promised to me when he said in John 16, 32 and 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but you can take heart because I've overcome the world. I love these words of Jesus because if my faith is firmly placed in Jesus who has overcome the world, what do I need to fear in a world filled with things that are so fearful? If I know I am following and have faith in the one who will catch me, not just if I fall, but who catches me knowing I most assuredly will fall because that's who I am. I'm not the one who can reach for his glory, but I am the one who has been saved by grace through faith. And though my faith may feel small, my faith is in the one who has overcome the world, who has paid for sin, who has defeated death itself. And of this, I am assured. It reminds me of a story. A story that, that I heard one told one time about the, the San Francisco. If you've ever been to San Francisco, you know the icon there is the Golden Gate Bridge, built in the 1930s. And driving over the bridge today, it is, it is a sight to behold. It is breathtaking. It, it is nerve-wracking for me because you're just so high up and wind and fog. And well, it's just amazing. But what's amazing when you drive over that bridge or you see it from a distance is to think about how that bridge was, was built in the 30s. It cost an estimated amount, was it was going to cost $35 million to build. But the estimate wasn't just about the cost of the construction, it was also the cost of lives. 35 workers were going to be estimated to be killed on this project because at that day, every $1 million you spent on a bridge usually indicated one worker would die. A very high cost indeed. But the builders of this bridge were determined that that would not happen. And in a scale and in the difficulty of this project, they came up with incredible ideas. Up to that time, safety equipment for the most part was optional on the job site. Kind of like that attitude, I'm a tough guy, I don't need safety lines or or hard hats or masks. Except they made it mandatory or the worker would be fired. And on top of that, they gave respirators to to riveters for the first time. They gave glare-free goggles to deal with the sun reflecting off of the water. They gave them special hand and face cream to help deal with the winds. And they gave them diets to help them fight with the dizziness, sauerkraut juice cures for those who were drinking too much in a field hospital right there. But perhaps the biggest investment of all, at least cost-wise, was $130,000, a lot of money during that day, for a safety net under the bridge during the roadway construction, extended 10 feet out on both sides, on both trusses. Now, 11 men were, were killed still, because, even with that in place, including 10 at one time when scaffolding broke through and broke that net, but way fewer than the 35 that had been projected to die. In fact, 19 men were were directly saved by that net. And all of the men worked harder and faster and more secure because they knew there was a net that was there to catch them. And so that they could work by, by faith and not by fear. Now I tell you this so that I can tell you this. When it comes to your life, there is no object of faith that can match Jesus Christ. 
You can work on the bridge of life by yourself and just pretend to cover up the dangers and insulate and ignore the scary things that are outside of your control, even though you might have thought you had some control over them. And in these past months, you've recognized how little that control really is, that it really was just a feeling, it wasn't reality. Or you can put your faith in a safety net of Jesus, who through his cross and by his resurrection invites you to trust him with both your life and your death. And who promises that even death itself cannot have any hold over you because he's defeated it. And he is a real and certain person who is for you. So when we move forward in faith in Jesus Christ, that even though at times our faith feels small and weak, the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, is never small and never weak. He'll catch you every time. So let's be the church in this moment, wherever we are, that is shining and sharing Jesus with an abundant generosity and a confidence that Jesus is working through even these temporary trials to do something incredibly good for us and for those who are in our lives with whom we can share the hope that we have in Jesus as well. Church, this is our time. This is our place to shine the hope that we have in the greatest safety net of all. Jesus Christ, who will catch you, not just if you fall, but who catches you because he knows you will fall. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, in these moments, in these times, we recognize that there are many things to be afraid of in this world. Many things that are overwhelming us. Many things that that are filling our minds and our thoughts. We're confused at where to get the right source of of knowledge. We see conflicting reports on news stories and research and we're trying to navigate through these waters. But in the midst of our navigation of this crazy storm that we're in, in the midst of our different boats as we journey through it, all experiencing it in different ways, we take confidence that you are with us. We take confidence that you'll never leave us, that you'll never forsake us. We take confidence that you will catch us when we fall. And so we don't have to worry about our fall. We don't have to be concerned about what happens when we fail or we don't have to be worried about our death because we know you've got us. And so with that taken care of, you've allowed us to live in this moment we're in right now. And Jesus, help us not to pass it up. Help us to use these this temporary things that, that you've given to us to be generous to those around us who are hurting so that through our generosity they may see you, Jesus. Help us to see that that this time of suffering, you're you're gonna use it because you promise that you can work for the good of those who love you, who are called upon, called by your name and that you can work in this time and in this way. And so we trust you to do that. And, And Jesus, we come before you this day asking that you would just use us as the body of Christ, as your church to do that collectively and individually. Lord, we pray for those other agencies and institutions through which you allow us to just show that love to our neighbor and provide for those in need, for those who are destitute and homeless, for those who are suffering unemployment and underemployment. Lord, use us too to to aid them in their needs and assist them to to find labor and supply for all their needs. Lord, we pray for those who are are suffering loneliness, who are suffering the, the burdens of life without friendship or family for those depressed or weary of pandemic measures. We pray for the fellowship of our church that we may bear one another's burdens and live in community knowing that you, Jesus, are the head of the church. And Lord, especially we lift up those who are sick and suffering in this moment. By name, we know of Joshua and Joy, Tim, Glendon, Ivy, Vicky, Audrey, Dolores, Dawn, Leon and his family. Joe, those struggling with mental health issues, and others that we name silently in our hearts in this moment. Grant healing to their bodies, peace for their minds, and consolation in their grief and sorrows. And Lord, you know our earth here, and you know how dry it has been. We ask you to continue to send rain upon our land in seasonable weather so that those who labor in the fields, who are working in hard times, would be blessed by their labor. 
protect them and sustain them in this important work. Father, look upon our nation and those who lead. You've put them in these positions of authority, your word declares. So we ask, Lord, that they would give an end to this pandemic, that you would bring peace among the nations, an end to terror and violence, and that all of us in our vocations would work for the common good so that justice may prevail, life may protect it, and truth abound. And Lord, as we recall the obedient life and the life-giving death of your son for our salvation, we pray you to strengthen our faith, to make our hearts bold, that we may not fear, but address our prayers to you in all humility. So hear us on behalf of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who stands before you now on our behalf, pleading our cause with his own blood, so that until that day that we are delivered from the changes and chances of this mortal life and stand before you in heaven, you would keep us in him who is our safety net that doesn't fail. Jesus Christ, our Lord who has taught us to pray with confidence and boldness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And friends, receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. When he told you you're not good enough, he told you you're not right. When he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight. When he told you you're not worthy. He told you you're not loved When he told you you're not beautiful You'll never be enough Fear, he is a liar He will take your breath Stop you in your steps Fear, he is a liar Rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. When he told you you're troubled, you'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'll never find a home. When he told you you were dirty, and you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one, that grace could never change. Fear, he is a liar. Take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness. Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. He is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fear. 
Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Let your fire fall and cast down all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Let your fire fall and cast down all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel let your fire fall and cast down all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Fear, he is a liar He will take your breath, stop you in your steps Fear, he is a liar he will rob your rest, steal your happiness Fear, he is a liar He will take your breath, stop you in your steps Fear, he is a liar He will rob your rest, steal your happiness Cast your fear in the fire Cause fear, he is a liar Cause fear, he is a liar Cause fear, he is a liar Go in peace, serve the Lord, have a blessed week.